sponsoring this event and for all the pizza and the drinks. And feel free to get up at any time and get more pizza and more drinks. Don't feel like you're disturbing the group. All I ask is to just walk this way and come down and go back up. That would be really great. There's also handouts that uh, Victor brought from financial aid. If you haven't gotten them, I think there's some on the bottom right-hand corner. You can grab some on the way out. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists so we can get started. So, all the way um, to the right, we have Victor Ho, who is our Director of Financial Aid. Mm -hmm. And he has been newly appointed in this role, correct, since about, for about a year, but you're with the office for how long? Eight years. Eight years before that. And he has an MBA, <laughs> which is really helpful when talking about anything financial, related, financial aid related. Um, next thing we have Claire Johnson Raba. She's a 2010 grad from Hastings. She uh, began her career as an Equal Justice Works Fellow. So for those of you who are two L's, come see me about applying for those fellowships. Um, and she was uh, placed at Bay Area Legal Aid. Claire used her fellowship to launch a full service consumer law practice uh, at Bay Legal, uh, which now serves hundreds of low income clients annually through full representation and unbundled clinics uh, based services in five counties throughout the Bay Area. So Claire's pretty amazing and she's very committed to Hastings, so I'm sure you're going to see her around quite a bit. Um, next to her is my dear friend, Hina Shaw, who is also uh, the director of the Women's Employment Rights Center at Golden Gate Law School. Um, and the clinic that she works in addresses employment issues faced by low wage and immigrant workers through individual and impact litigation, policy advocacy, and grassroots community education. Hina has interned at many nonprofits in the Bay Area and has worked as an attorney in the private sector, nonprofit sector, and government sectors before joining um, the faculty at Golden Gate. I think I met you when you were at Beijing Law Tacos at that time. Um, but Hina last year wrote a very interesting article, an op-ed in the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, it was titled, San Francisco Needs Housing Solutions to Keep Middle Class Families um, in, San, in, in the City. So you should definitely Google it and read the article because it's really interesting. She raises a lot of fascinating points, which I hope you will kind of bring up today. Um, and she's also a Hastings grad. She graduated in 1995. And next to her is Mel Frejo. Did I say that right? <laughs> um, he graduated from Hastings in 2013, so he's the most recent grad on our panel. Um, he's interned and worked for various nonprofits throughout the Bay Area, including the East Bay Community Law Center and San Francisco Human Rights Commission. He's currently a tenant representative um, in the city of Oakland for the Housing Residential Rent and Relocation Board, as well as a consultant of the California Department of Fair Housing, um, excuse me, California Department of Fair Employment and Housing, where he investigates housing discrimination through the state, so also really interesting work. Um, so let's give a round to these panelists. So just briefly, I know you know I did the introduction, but I would love to just generally, you know, for those of us in the room who aren't familiar with the type of work that you do, I'd love to get a sense of sort of what your day job is. So Sarah, let's start with you. Sure. Thanks so much for having me here, Bruce. Um, so I'm a direct services legal aid attorney, which means I work day in and day out with poverty, clients living in poverty. Um, my specialized area of practice is consumer law, um, but people who live in poverty present with a lot of different problems. So we might have somebody who is being evicted, but then they're also concerned because there's an inaccuracy on their credit report, um, which is going to cause them problems even if they negotiate a decent move out of the current place they're in. Um, so I see people for credit reporting issues, debt collection matters, um, and anything else really that's got to do with credit and debt, foreclosure issues, and we have a lot of crossover in our other practice areas, for example, um, domestic violence. So I started my work at Bay Area Legal Aid as an Equal Justice Works Fellow, focused primarily on the economic self-sufficiency issues um, affecting domestic violence survivors. So when a survivor leaves an abusive relationship, um, there are a lot of things that stand in the way to establishing self-sufficiency. 
And really one of the first places you want to look is, let's see what's going on on that credit report. Because a lot of times the abuser has done damage to that credit report. Um, so I got my foot in the door with Bay Legal, uh, with the Equal Justice Works Fellowship. But at the time that I started there, Bay Area Legal Aid wasn't really doing anything with credit and debt for the general client population. And so now we've expanded that work, which means that I spend at least one or two days a week out at clinic. Um, so that's out in Bay Point, which is East Contra Costa County, Redwood City, which is in San Mateo County, American Canyon, which is in Napa, up by Vallejo, um, Fremont, which is south in Alameda County. So we reach out to the outer reaches of the Bay Area where the urban and suburban poor live, right? We have a very large geographic area that Bay Area Legal Aid serves. So I spend a fair amount of time on the road, and I bring law students with me. I bring volunteer attorneys with me. Um, and we see as many as, you know, up to 30 to 35 people in one day at our clinics. Um, and so we call that a scalable solution um, and an efficient use of resources because there are three of us staff attorneys, and if we made everybody come into our office in San Francisco, we'd see a lot fewer clients than if we went out into the community where the, where, what we do, we go out into the community where the, the clients and potential clients live, and we provide Know Your Rights workshops, and we do basic paperwork form filling and educational services out there, and from there we also do screening and we pick up our interesting cases. And those are the big affirmative litigation cases where we sue the mortgage servicer, or we sue the debt collector, or we sue the debt settlement company, right? And those are some of the ways that we fund our consumer law work because those bring in attorney's fees. So that's, that's what I do as a direct services practitioner. I spend a lot of time in the community, I spend a whole lot of time with clients, and I spend a little bit, a fair amount of time on, on litigation as well. And you're usually commuting on your motorcycle. I'm frequently commuting on my motorcycle. <laughs> Uh, my, um, as you can tell from my year of graduation, I've been out for a while, uh, and so my work is very different uh, than a kind of a, a little line attorney. How many of you have taken clinics here in Hastings? I'm a clinical professor. That's basically what I do at Lincoln Gate. I do actually quite a bit of work with uh, the Hastings Civil Justice Clinic, and we collaborate, but it's very similar uh, to what you might experience here with your professors. Uh, um, I'm a professor. Um, I teach a seminar class, a companion seminar class on employment rights uh, with the skills component. So we're teaching students how to uh, do good interviewing skills, how to uh, negotiate a settlement, uh, how to do administrative hearings, because we actually represent. So I have my professor hat, but I'm also running a small nonprofit legal uh, uh, legal services organization at the law school, uh, and the purpose is dual. Uh, our, our, we have two purposes. One is to serve the community. Uh, our mission is to represent mortgage workers. And in the last four years, we've spent almost all of our resources dedicated to uh, a very vulnerable sector of our community, which is domestic workers and caregivers, predominantly women, women of color, immigrants. Many of them are undocumented. Uh, and so we are providing legal services uh, and community education to this group of uh, uh, workers. But my other job, my other hat, is to teach students like yourself to become good litigators and hopefully to promote and incite a passion for social justice. Uh, and so my day is very uh, varied. I mean, we do a lot of different things. Uh, and I'll just tell you this week what I did. Uh, we have um, five clients who we are going to be representing uh, at the Labor Commissioner. The Labor Commissioner is a state agency uh, that adjudicates wage claims. The students are going to be the legal advocates, and I have been working with the students and getting them ready to do each of examination, cross-examination, uh, evidentiary objections, and just basically meeting with them, reviewing their uh, materials, helping them do some mock, and then bringing in our clients where the students are uh, providing uh, uh, the prep work for the clients. The students are going to do the hearing, but I'm there along the way of making sure that the students are getting the best experience and getting feedback, kind of constant feedback as they're preparing. Uh, we also do impact litigation. So I have another group of students who last, last week helped to finalize a complaint that we filed in Superior Court on behalf of a domestic worker who's suing for uh, wage and hour and sexual harassment issues. Uh, at the same time, we helped uh, prep our client and a bunch of community groups who are interested in this case to uh, do a press conference. So uh, it, while it was not a litigation hat, but it was very much a legal tactical hat, helping our community partners and our client uh, both 
understand the rules of defamation and what they can and can't say, and to really be strategic in about what the messaging is. Um, so I uh, and the students and I work with our community groups in getting our clients and them ready for a press conference. We also do some policy advocacy. We are the, the clinic is the legal counsel to the California Domestic Worker Coalition. I don't know if any of you have been following the news in the last few years, but you know, uh, there's a large sector of domestic workers who have been excluded from basic wage and hour protections that most workers have. Our clinic has been representing domestic workers for a really long time, and the coalition, there's a group of nonprofit, statewide, grassroots groups who are wanted to do some legislative changes, and they hired us pro bono uh, to help them uh, navigate the legislative uh, arena and to help draft the bill. For the past four years, we've been doing that. So this week, we had a, a convening of the coalition, and two of my students actually, they wanted to focus on enforcement next uh, and implementation, and I had a group of students get ready to present in Spanish. Uh, uh, many of the coalition members are vulnerable Spanish speakers. Um, um, on, on domestic worker enforcement rights. So it's pretty, uh, like I have a very uh, wide range of things that I do uh, and to expose students to both not just kind of the nuts and bolts of what litigation looks like, but all the varied roles of a lawyer and how you can use your law, law degree uh, to do different kinds of legal advocacy that is not necessarily litigation. She's also really humble because she <laughs> didn't mention she's actually working on a very high profile case right now for two tech workers who've had some issues with their domestic workers. So if you Google Hina's name, that will come up. Noah. So uh, my name is Noah Frigo. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I My day job is at the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. So it's a state agency, but it's the largest civil rights agency in the country. Uh, I investigate housing discrimination complaints for the state. Uh, I have a caseload of about 100 uh, cases that are kind of in all stages of the investigation. And uh, DFEH is a neutral agency, so you know, I have a direct service uh, nonprofit background, but in uh, working for the state, we are not doing as much advocacy, it's much more about um, fact finding and you know investigating witnesses, uh, subpoenaing documents, basically trying to gather evidence to determine if there's reasonable cause to believe that discrimination occurred in a given case. Um, and uh, I have also I, I sit on the Oakland Housing Residential Rent and Relocation Board which is just a really long-winded way of saying the rent board, which uh, covers a couple of different things. Uh, there are appeals of uh, determinations on rent increases by the Rent Adjustment Program in Oakland, and that, so that's if a uh, landlord's trying to increase the rent, or if a tenant wants the rent decreased because there are substantial habitability issues with their uh, apartment, then they can come to the rent board and try and get a judgment about what the rent should be. And if they appeal it, then it comes before the board that I sit on. And the other thing this board does is work on uh, changes to the regulations of the Oakland Rent Adjustment Program. So, you know, trying to increase protections for tenants through rent control and things like that. So. You know, we're all here today because we want to hear from you about how you're managing, doing these amazing jobs in public service and government, and still managing to survive and live in the Bay Area, which is getting more and more expensive day by day. So, Noah, I want to direct my question, my next question to you, since you're a recent graduate, coming out of school, I'm not sure, more debt than he and I graduated with. You know, you had the choice in school to either go the private sector route or the public sector route, you chose this route. Mm -hmm. And so I think everyone here would love to hear about how you're sort of, you know, what your sort of repayment program looks like, or how do you manage that, and rent, and you're working in housing issues, so that's sure. right up your alley as well. Sure. So, I mean, the first thing that I would say is don't worry too much about student debt. I mean, it's the only kind of debt where your, what you make determines the percentage of what you're paying. And for me, you know, there's this gigantic abstract number out there that 
doesn't seem like it's ever going to go down, and uh, you know it, it freaks me out sometimes. But I think you know I I got into an income based repayment plan as soon as I graduated, which was the most important thing. Um, I had my loans transferred to Fed Loan Servicing so that. Uh, they count towards the, the federal loan forgiveness program. And then um, getting in PICAP it is fairly straightforward. And, uh, you know, that cut my loan payments in half. So um, I think in terms of managing debt, um, I don't know. For me, the biggest thing was all the credit card debt that I accrued being in school and trying to, like, live day to day. Uh, and so, you know, once I was able to pay that off, I, I feel like, um, you know, you guys are, are living in the Bay Area now. You probably have some strategies in place for dealing with incredibly high rents and cost of living. Um, obviously, that's going to be really important as you go forward. Uh, but, yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, Getting into the, the IBR program, Fed Loan Servicing, and PICAP as soon as possible was um, you know, one of those things that really helped me feel a little better about my situation. And my next question is to you, Victor. So can you translate what Noah just said? Like, what are these programs for the students here who don't know what they are, and how do they work? And you can just briefly go over it, because they can go into the details later, but just an overview. So um, my main duty is to maintain the integrity of all the federal, state, and existing funding programs. Our goal is to get every fully funded so you get enough money to pay for direct costs, student uh, fee, tuition fees, and living expenses. And uh, Noah is a perfect example of a student who went to Hastings, grad, borrowed a lot of student loan get involved with federal work study program, equal justice, and went through, take advantage of the two wonderful program that we offer, that we have, and make it happen. Basically, uh, the average debt that people graduated from last year, last May, was $129,000. That's the average. And uh, by the time you add on any interest accrued while in school, then three years in school, and the grades after school, that come out to about $143,000 debt. And uh, under the standard repayment program, 10 years long, average of 6.5 interest, average on your loan together, you are looking at a standard payment of $1,660 a month for 10 years. And it is almost impossible for people just starting out in the legal career, whether you're in non-profit or for-profit, but would be worse in the nonprofit field. And uh, to attract and maintain talents like you or Noah who want to be working, follow your heart, and do the work in the public services, the uh, federal government offer the Federal Loan Forgiveness Program, which I will go into detail later. Along with it, Hastings has a very generous program called PICAP, which is a loan repayment assistance uh, to pay you back for some of the payment that you make to your student loan, which is already very small to begin with, because basically what you want to do is, as soon as your loan gets into repayment, you want to contact your federal loan servicer, ask them to put you into the income-driven repayment <coughs> plan. Within the income-driven repayment plan, there are three different programs. Which and now that's a federal plan, correct? Yes. And, and that so first you enroll in PICAP. <laughs> no, that's separate. That's right. right. Yeah. So, but you do that through the school. Yeah. And yeah. now you're talking yeah. about the federal. Right. Right. just want right. to clarify right. that. Right. So basically the whole idea is it will not be, the payment won't be based on how much you owe, but on how much you make. It's still around pay as you earn. So it makes it so affordable, so manageable. So don't let the loan debt bother you or scare you for not getting to the field. It is there, you can avoid it, but it will be so manageable and affordable. And if you follow what we have to tell you about, you will see it light at the end of two months. And, and this just is as an example, uh, you know, that 1600 a month number, my payment I think is like $70 a month. 
And so it, it really is significantly reduced. KSU Earn caps you at 10% of your income. Um, Income-based repayment caps you at 15% of your income. And the new uh, Department of Ed regs, the repay plan mm -hmm. that is currently on the books, um, will also cap at 10% and provide some additional protections. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, though, for folks who are married or considering getting married, is that um, it is 10% or 15% of that uh, combined income, um, unless uh, you, you do married filing separately and you transmute your community property to separate property. And actually, that's what, what I do. So I'm, my, I'm, I'm married, and my spouse and I still, we still qualify for PICAP. We don't make a, a whole lot of money for the Bay Area. But we, would make, we make enough money that if I were on the IBR plan with my spouse's income, my, my payments would be about six or $700 a month. But we've made a calculated decision as a family um, that we take a tax hit every year. And we do married filing separately. And we also, we don't have anything. Like we don't own a house. We don't own stocks. We don't own any property. So for us, it's a really a sort of a non-issue to transmute our community property. Um, but it's one thing to consider if you, if you go into the newest plan, which is probably going to be approved for next year and which will be available by the time you guys get out there, the repayer plan, the repay plan, um, allegedly closes the married filing separately loophole. So you need to look at the money, and I'm sure Victor in the financial aid office can help you run the numbers on all of this. Equal Justice Works also provides a webinar for that's called Dealing with Student Down Loaning. And Heather Jarvis, who's with the National Consumer Law Center, um, is also a consultant and works with Equal Justice Works. So if you Google Heather Jarvis and you Google Equal Justice Works, there's a really good webinar out there for people who want to go into public interest law and the mechanics of this and the breakdown of this, and the breakdown of the federal programs. There are the three different federal programs out there, IVR, PAYE, and then they're going to be the new three PAYE by the time you guys get out there. But if you're married to a spouse who makes a whole lot of money, um, you might want to keep that and run the numbers first to see how it all plays out. Um, for us, it's kind of close because, because uh, you know, we take a pretty big, you do take a tax hit. Um, but if I had a spouse who made $200,000 a year or something, you, you know, then you would probably be paying significantly. You'd let me pay close to that $1,000 number or something. I don't know the numbers. But there are IBR and pay calculators online at the Department of Ed website, um, studentaid.gov, right? So you go to studentaid.gov. And you can run IBR calculators as married, as married filing separately, and as single. So it doesn't mean you have to like put off your plans to get married because you're going into public interest law. That's totally not the case. But I do want you guys to keep in mind that you should do some more research and make sure you don't just jump into the into the newest plan if you happen to have a spouse that makes who's in who's in private practice or something like that. And that's a very good point that she she made because under the new plan, unlike mm -hmm. the regular IVR where if you are married found separate, only your income you count it for the calculation. Under the new plan that will be coming out, regardless on how you file it. But the existing, but the other plan still exists. So I actually yeah. was talking to a couple of folks about this who were part of the um, rulemaking process and, and contributed to the rulemaking process at the Department of Ed. And so the, the IBR yes. plan and the existing payee plan will continue to yes. to be available options. And under those options, then you have additional ways to address spousal income. So. Thank you. Something to keep in mind. And then they put all this information together and send it to Zora. Right. We're going to forward it on to you. Is anyone here not an H12 member or not on the H12 member list? Okay, just come talk to me. I'll get your email address. And just quickly, a 10%, 15%, uh, you need to keep this in mind. It's not on your income. It's from your AGI minus the federal poverty level for a family or person to be, to be able to live on when you practice law. Then you time that by either 10 or 15 percent, depends on which plan you qualify for, divided by 12, that's your, how much your monthly payment will be. So as, as Noah said, he pays 70 or something like that, and I pay 171 a month, because I have a family size of three, because I I, I'm able to count my family size with my income. So and here's the beauty, the payment that you're making, mostly will be paid back by his thing to make it even Exactly. Better. I'm still, I'm five years out and I'm still on the PICAP program. So at this point, Hastings gives me 8.6. So Hastings gives me 
Um, and so, and then my employer provides a small uh, stipend. Many, many nonprofit employers do. So I also, the Bay Legal provides another like $3,000 a year as student loan benefit. So um, I actually don't really pay anything out of pocket for my student loans. All I really end up paying out of pocket is that tax hit that I take because we do, we, 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 we do our taxes differently than we would if I didn't have the student loan burden. Um, so my loans are negatively amortizing, which means I pay less every month than they accrue in interest. So that means that when my when um, that my loan balances are actually going up. Um, on my credit report, they don't show as going up because they don't the, in, the interest isn't capitalized on there when you're on the payment plan, at least for the purposes of credit reporting, as far as I can tell, which is good. Because on your credit report, you don't want an installment loan that's growing, right? But it, does, it is so it's showing steady, like it never shows a reduction. And every time I get my credit score, one of the things that I see is you have, you're not reducing your installment loan significantly enough. So that's, that is one thing to consider if, you're, if your IBR plan, you know, is, I mean, you're, is, is, you know, if you're trying to buy a house and things like that, you want to make sure that everything else on your credit is probably spotless because your credit might be a few points lower than somebody else who's making regular payments uh, that are reducing the installment balance of the student loan. And to piggyback what you just say about the negative amortization, you have to be careful because you have to be in all the way. It's on nothing into this loan forgiveness. Let's say if you do five years and the loan go into big your principal, the time that you decide to leave the program, that's how much you owe because you probably owe more at the point that you leave the nonprofit world into the for profit. So all exactly balance accrued at that point with a negative amortization, bigger than what you borrow. So my loans are one. 40 something, and if I were to like, if I were going to private practice, my, my the interest would capitalize, and I would owe significantly more after five years that interest is growing. However, the public service loan forgiveness program is a 120 month plan. Okay, so you need 120 qualifying months of public service, and actually, it's 120 qualifying public months of qualifying service in any 501c3, so any nonprofit working full time or any government agency, so that could be a public school. And you don't have to have a JD, you don't have to be working as a lawyer to do public service loan forgiveness. We tell our low income client, we get our low income clients on income based repayment, and if they work for the county or they work for a public school, they're eligible for public service loan forgiveness, so we also get their loans transferred for service in the Fed loan. Um, so it's 120 qualifying months, which means, like Noah said, you want to get your loans consolidated, or if you don't want to consolidate them, that's fine too. You can still be on, on IBR without it being consolidated. But you want to get your loans onto the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program and an income-dependent program, so an IDR, independent, income-dependent repayment, as soon as possible, because that first year out of law school, your payment plan is going to be zero, right? Because your income was like zero when you were in law school. So it depends, your income based repayment is dependent on your last year's taxes. So when you're a 3L, you're not going to be earning much money. But you go to work for a nonprofit or government, um, and, a, a, and I would think that, that judicial clerkships count for IBR, even though they don't count for PICAP, is that right? And judicial clerkships? It doesn't count for PICAP. Judicial clerkships don't count for PICAP, but I, I think judicial clerkships count fine for IBR because you're working for the government, right? You're working for the federal government, the state government. Um, so uh, that first year, your loan payment's going to be zero, but really, you should you need to get your loans on the public service loan forgiveness program because that's 12 months if you're 120 months, right? So don't delay in getting into the program as soon as you get out of law school, even though your loans will tell you you've got a six-month deferment, right? You got a six-month deferment before your loans even go into repayment. You should waive that six-month deferment, get them into repayment, even though your payment will be zero, so that you can benefit from that 12 months in public service when your loans are at zero. So that's a lot of information, a lot of technical information. Does anyone have any questions on anything? Said so far? Yes. I, still, excuse me. I still don't really understand what PICAP is. So PICAP is a loan repayment assistance program where if you qualify for, it's a six month cycle. If you apply for it, we approve you, we'll pay you back for most of the loan payment that you have made. It's a Hastings program. Free, free money from Hastings. 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 Free money from Hastings. Yeah. 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 Free money from
money from his, interest free, tax free like money you pay, from You pay your loan and then you put in the paperwork and then you get a nice check uh, for the amount of your loan. But here's the beauty, you can combine both programs into the low payment, income driven for loan forgiveness and we will pay you back for most of the payment that you make well, in the form of a short term loan and then the next six month cycle when you apply we qualify you again with our cancel that loan. And, and PICAP is pretty generous about the, the boundaries, so even though PICAP does include your spouse's income, um, they have your spouse's income and, and the combined family can make up to like $150,000 a year and you can still be in the program. So, um, so Hastings PICAP is, is, pretty, is pretty generous about the I don't even understand how that's possible. <laughs> well, you know, they, the school recognizes how important it is. I mean, we have such a good reputation for placing students in public and just public service jobs, right? That's our commitment from Hastings. We have one of the highest number of students that go into public and just public service. And so the school is very committed for those of you who are pursuing those careers to want to help you in, in any way that they can so you're not burdened by making that choice. However, in the past, we were so proud to say, if you qualify for we will pay you for it. Literally, because the pool of people coming in are more than people leaving the program. So it gets to the point where it's not sustainable financially. So we do now put a cap into how much a year a person can get and how much total every lifetime a person can get and we put a cap on the salary as well. But since people are in the income income based repayment programs, I think that that's probably beneficial for the there's it's a requirement that you be in an income driven plan yes. to be in PICAP. Yes. Um, so that reduces the amount of payout but you can't be in like a ten year repayment plan and take sixteen hundred dollars a month from the PICAP yeah. program. Yeah. You're asked to take right. you know as, as much as the smallest amount as possible. Right, right. So we have questions here, yes. Yeah. And it might relate to you know if this if you can relate, but I am under the I under if I understand it correctly, high cap doesn't apply to your undergrad debt as well. No. So have you had do you have undergrad debt and if so how are you handling that? I want yes, to so, that. So um, I do have undergrad debt and there are loans um, from Hastings that are not covered under high cap as well. Yes. So um, the thing is that with the income-based repayment, um, it really cuts down on the size of your loan. So I would say, I think um, my pie cap, the, the part that's covered under pie cap is like $62 a month, and then it's $70 a month for my undergrad loans and all the loans I took out of Hastings that aren't covered. Um, so it, even though, you know, it, there's this huge number and it's getting larger, it's still on a day-to-day -day level fairly manageable. What you may want to do is to have your loan from undergrad extended as long as possible into the regular extended repayment plan 25 years, or have them consolidate extended up to 30 years, make minimal payment on it, and then consolidate the rest of your existing loan, which include the Perkins, into a big new loan, because Perkins by itself cannot be part of either program. But if you include Perkins loan into the consideration, that the whole big new loan will be part of it. So Victor, just quickly, um, we do have people that counsel, that come in, consultants that come to counsel students on these, they're very specific loans, and who is that person and what time of year do they go? We have Dr. Hanson come in twice a year to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one for a 45 minute session to go over all your debt, whether it is your private consumer debt prior to coming to Hastings, debt from other grad school before you transfer in, or debt from other grad debt from Hastings. So basically what you want to do is to print out a credit report so all your consumer debt can be included, and a federal loan history report, and tell him whether you want to practice law in a for-profit or non-profit. It will, it will work, walk with you through the whole thing to give you an idea how it can be so manageable. And if you want to know what your federal student debt is, you go to nslds.ed.gov. And so anything that you know you have a loan on that's not listed there is probably a private loan. So some people might have private loans from undergrad, and private loans are not eligible for things like income-based repayment because they're not Department of Ed. Loans and private loans are a whole other terrible, horrible animal. And they are like we do a lot of work around private loans, and if people have specific issues with.
private loans in default or anything like that, you guys can contact me individually. I'm happy to answer questions about those. But, but everything we've said today re refers to, well, I guess, refers to government, re refers to yeah. Department of Ed loans, refers to federal loans. Um, so if you have any private loans from undergrad, those are a different animal. Those, uh, those act like regular old consumer loans. And one thing you need to be careful, a lot of companies will approach you, say, hey, we offer you a brand new loan for you to borrow to pay off all your loan. Don't do it. Because you turn it into a good federal guarantee loan into a regular private loan. And you walk away from all the federal benefits that we discussed earlier, like federal loan forgiveness program or the packet program. So anything that sends you anything in the mail, also anything that sends you anything in the mail and, and wants to help you with your loans is a scam. And in fact, the East Bay Community Law Center, where Noah used to work, is, is working up a lawsuit right now against one of these student loan scammers. So if you get stuff in the mail that says, you know, um, and even the companies that are legitimate consolidation companies, unless you're really trying to, to pay your plan off, your loan off in like a regular 10-year plan, um, if you're interested in public sector work, you never, ever, ever, like Victor said, you never, ever, ever want to consolidate your loans into a private loan out of the federal law. So you want to stay with the Department of Ed and stay with Fed Loan and Direct Loan stuff. Is there another question in the slide? No. Okay, so the next question we have is directly to Tina. So, you're raising a family in San Francisco. What is that like, being a public interest? You know, your husband's in public service, you're in public interest. Can you share a little bit about how you guys do it? Sure. Um, you know, I think one thing to remember, and I don't think I appreciated this when I was a law student, was that you're going to work for a really long time. I mean, many of you are in your 20s or your 30s. You're going to probably work 30 or 40 years. Uh, and that, you know, things that, all things can happen in time. Uh, and so when I graduated from law school, I did work for a nonprofit, and I made very little money. But at that time, I uh, had a very manageable student loan. Uh, Hastings had some great, had high cap, um, and I was able to like live a great life in San Francisco. I've been very fortunate uh, to survive in San Francisco. Uh, I've been a renter until last year. Uh, but I think that part of what, uh, what you have to really think about is not like I think there are too many people who look at the growing inequality in the Bay Area or in San Francisco and say, I can't afford it, and then just give up and leave. Uh, and, that, and, and many people leave public interest because of the same thing. Like, I'm never going to be able to afford a house. I'm never going to be able to have kids on the salary. And actually, things happen and your life adjusts. And, you know, it, it, it happens. And, and it's a, it was some good planning, um, like meeting with financial aid early on. Uh, I did, and when I was at a nonprofit, they provided free financial services. They were like, you could get a free consult. Uh, I started, you know, they told me right away, like when I was in my 20s, to put away money for my retirement. And I was like, what? And they're like, do it now. And, and so I was happy to get some good advice that allowed me to plan, but then I just went and lived, lived my life. And, and the other thing to know is that there's a whole gradation of money uh, in public interest. So, you know, when I started, I was a line attorney, a staff attorney. I made like I don't know thirty thousand dollars. It was like even in this in this day and age, it was not a lot of money. Uh, but you know, as I've uh, I've changed jobs, I've gone into government. I made more money when I was in government than I left, and and then I'm now in uh, in, in, uh, in law school, and it's not the best employer in terms of money. Um, I mean, I run a nonprofit, so I make a nonprofit salary, but I don't make the line attorney salary anymore because I've I've been out twenty years. Uh, and, and, and that happens. You, even in nonprofit, you your income will increase. It. I, what, one of the biggest things that is, I think, stressful uh, is the income, the wealth disparity that is happening. As things are becoming more and more expensive, I mean, a gallon of milk now is ridiculous. Um, uh, that I think that we need to be engaged citizens. Uh, and so I do feel like you know you'll figure it out and you'll make decisions. I mean, my family and I were very committed to staying in San Francisco. Uh, we got gentrified out of the mission after renting a place for 10 years. Uh, we're not rent controlled. Uh, and and I, 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 it was, I mean, we 
we could not afford to buy a single family home. But we did our research. We really were committed. We were like, is there a place we can rent? We ended up finding a co-op apartment to buy that was actually below market. Uh, so there's ways that there's, there's, you have to be committed. I've seen so many of my friends and family leave the Bay Area because they think that they just can't afford it. But I feel like you have to put some, you know, roll up your sleeves and be like, I'm, I'm committed to staying here. Um, the city needs um, public interest lawyers. This, our state needs public interest lawyers. There's a huge disparity in services. Uh, and so when you're thinking about your long-term choices, take baby steps. You know, don't think down the road like I'm never going to be able to. I, I've lived here for 20 years. I never was able, I never thought I would be a homeowner. But we figured it out. Like somehow it worked out at the time that we needed it. Uh, there's really smart um, home assistance buying programs, uh, and get involved, you know, be involved in the political discussion about affordability in the Bay Area and about legal services, uh, because I think that until we become engaged in that political discussion uh, about saying, hey, you know, we matter, uh, uh, we want to do good, uh, and wanna, uh, we want to be able to survive in the Bay Area, and I think there are places that, you know, I have two small children, uh, and you know, I don't know, there's all these things that I didn't learn about, like San Francisco has a preschool uh, subsidy when your ch child turns four. I, mean, it was, I, I was like, wow, I didn't know that. Um, there's, there's, the, once you start looking into, when, when your life calls for you to figure something out, do your homework, don't, get, don't let fear drive your decision making. Uh, and, and also I think there's a lot of wonderful things the dichotomy is not, I'm going to be a poor public interest lawyer or I'm going to work for corporate law. Do not fall into that dichotomy. There, in between, there is so many amazing things you could do as a lawyer that helps regular people uh, get legal services and get access to justice. I was a private interest, I, I worked for a labor union firm for a long time. Uh, I loved working there. I was working for unions. I made more than nonprofits. Uh, and then I, you know, I left because I really wanted to work with unrepresented workers. Uh, you make it work. But there isn't this thing like I'm going to be a big corporate lawyer or I'm going to be a nonprofit attorney. In between, there are choices that you can make even in private sector where you're doing good and representing people who really need legal services and access to justice. So that's my kind of elder statesman speech. And on that note, Claire, I just want to ask you a particular question that, you know, aside from the salary that you're getting from the delay, a lot of you fundraise for your own positions, correct? You can raise money, you write grants, you bring in people. So you were an Equal Justice Works fellow. They had to come up with a way to fund you to stay. Can you talk a little bit about how that works, that, that that's part of your role as a I mean, I think everyone who works at a legal services organization is aware that um, the money's tight. So I work for an organization that's Legal Services Corporation funded. So the Legal Services Corporation came out of Lyndon Johnson and the War on Poverty. Um, and the idea that folks needed access to civil representation in, 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 uh, in civil matters if they couldn't otherwise afford it. Uh, we don't quite have a civil Gideon, right? We don't have a legal right to an attorney, but the idea is that there's a legal services office which serves every county in the United States of America. And sometimes it's one legal service, like Legal Services of Oklahoma, I think, serves like 35 counties. Legal Services of Northern California has like, I think, a 24 or 26 county service area. Um, Bay Area Legal Aid serves seven counties, but we are very densely packed, right? That's the entire Bay Area. We go from Santa Clara up to Napa. Um, so when I started with Bay Area Legal Aid, they didn't have a consumer law program. And um, that wasn't because there was a need, but that was because it had not been identified as a priority area and we didn't have specific funding for that work. So I got my foot in the door with um, my Equal Justice Works Fellowship project. And as, as Hannah said, uh, I also made about as much money as she made starting out when I started out for the first couple of years. Um, and during that time, I filed a couple of lawsuits, which brought in some attorney's fees. Um, and I also created a community partnership with the United Way Bay Area, 
which has these spark point centers. So when I first started my clinics, and many and three of them are still co-located in these community centers, which also provide credit counseling and financial coaching and access to food stamp signups and job coaching and all these other sort of wraparound services that aren't legal services. So it's a perfect location for a consumer rights attorney because people who are trying to get their lives on track frequently present with legal problems. So part of the continuation of my position at Legal Aid um, was grant funded through our partnership with the United Way Bay Area Spark Point Centers. We also receive funding from various different family foundations that are interested in poverty eradication. So even though Bay Area Legal Aid has a grants and development team that actually do most of the grant writing, um, I have my eye out all the time for new things, new RFPs, which is request for proposal, um, for funding grants, and when I see those that are up my alley or the kind of work I do or could do, I send those to our grants team. And then once the grants team starts to write the proposal, I get brought into some meetings to meet with people, or I get asked for client stories or explanations of the needs, so I feel some of the substantive content for some of those grant applications to explain like, here's the work we do, here's how it's so successful, and here's how we could do more, because there's always a tremendous amount of unmet need. But there's philanthropy in the Bay Area, right? I mean, um, I know Facebook, the, those folks gave you know, a fair amount of money to the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. So a lot of the work that's being driven in the South Bay is being driven by some donations from tech companies. So there are actually a fair amount of partnerships that are being built right now between you know, nonprofit organizations and family foundations and tech companies, um, which means that um, you know, if you do go to work in private practice, there's work that can be done that contributes to nonprofit work as well, right? Law firms contribute grants, law firms contribute pro bono money, tech companies contribute contributions, they might sponsor a position, right, if they're interested in, for example, you know, niche issues like foster youth or something like that. Um, so, absolutely, I'm always on the lookout for additional funding opportunities for the work that we do, but I think nonprofits as a whole, that you as a frontline attorney don't necessarily need to staff your, need to fund your own position, but do know that nonprofits um, do generally have a large, you know, fundraising arm, and in the Bay Area, that's one thing, one of the reasons we have so many nonprofits is because we've got a really strong sort of feeling of philanthropy in the Bay Area, and there's a fair amount of private giving that goes on. So yes, question. Uh, so I was wondering about um, the union, the union board that you did. Um, so that's not public interest. Well, I think it would be considered private public interest, but it is in a private law firm. Uh, there are private law firms that unions hire. Uh, unions also have in-house legal departments, um, but you know it's traditionally a private sector work. But there's, but what I'm saying is that there are plain public interest private firms out there to work there. And that's something people don't think about, even starting your own solo practice, social justice practice. Like one thing we're launching now is the Bay Area Legal Incubator. Um, and I'm going to do programming for you guys on that because that's another way that people who are public interest, social justice minded can start their own practice. And just like that, there are, you know, tons of attorneys out there who are public interest and social justice minded who started their own private practice to address the needs of, say, modest needs clients, so clients that don't meet the income, income barrier for legal aid organizations, they're out there and they need help, and those are the attorneys that sort of address that. So, um, there are different ways to do this incredible work that's outside the nonprofit government sector. So, we have five minutes remaining, and I definitely want to make sure we have um, questions at the end, but I would love for you guys to, I'm going to start with you, Noah, just, you know, if there's anything that you want, if you want these everyone here to know that maybe something you wish you knew when you were in law school and no one told you that looks like <coughs> that, or any advice you want to get for the end today? Um, well, I mean, I guess I would just kind of end where I started, and I, I feel like, you know, when I was in law school, I was, there were so many things to worry about, and I was worried about pretty much everything, and uh, there are just a lot better things to be worrying about in your career than how, how are you going to pay for these loans. I think that, you know, finding something that you're passionate about and following that, it, that is the most important thing and everything else is going to fall into place. And, uh, I would echo that. You spend a lot of time both 
blend the light and just a lot of time working. Uh, and so you should really just follow your passion and be true to what uh, matters to you. Uh, because if going to a job that you dislike or are not interested in, is it, it can kill your soul. Uh, and so really everything else will fall into place. And also you don't have to figure it out yourself. So one of the things I would highly recommend is utilizing services. You know, going to see Victor, figuring it out yourself. But there are, your law school here has a lot of support, you know, uh, meeting with uh, uh, groups, uh, just making sure that you're utilizing the services to make your dream happen. But you do spend way too much time on the work, so you might as well enjoy it. I just want to add to what Hannah said about um, staying in the Bay Area. I mean, one of the ways, one of the very important things about getting a public interest job is how you spend your time during law school. And if you guys are already on the public interest track, you probably already know that. It's the internships, it's the clinical experience. I mean, sort of all of us in the public interest community in the Bay Area kind of know each other. And, and generally, if you want to go into public interest law, where you interned and where you volunteered and where you spent your time, it's going to make a big difference when you're putting a resume before a nonprofit organization upon graduation or you're thinking about a fellowship project. So um, you're building those networks and you're building that community already. So don't think that, you know, don't plan to flee just because the Bay Area has a really high cost of living. Um, you know, I, I still rent and I actually rent a large house and I have roommates. So I'm married and I have a kid, but my roommates are the auntie and uncle to my son. And it's like a great environment. Everybody's really happy. So um, we live in San Leandro, so that's a 40 minute commute in. Um, and daycare is a whole lot cheaper out in San Leandro than it is in San Francisco. Um, so yeah, so I want to I want to double what everybody else said here is that you make it work, and and there are a whole lot of different ways to live your life, and you're going to spend a long time living your life, and don't don't run away from the Bay Area because you're already building those networks that you're going to need to do public interest law. If you go somewhere else, you have to start all over with those networks. You've already done a tremendous amount of work for your public interest career. Thank you. What should the students sitting here know about financial aid? Uh, I would say work closely with our office. Know your option, select the right option, and then when you're done with school, work with your loan servicer and uh, give up with the new regulations, whether it's going to hurt you, it's going to help you, you need to know. And uh, there are agencies around who will help you. And how do you guys communicate with everyone? Um, do you tend to send out emails, Victor? Do you want them to refer to your website? Like, what, what do you think is the best way students can engage with your office? It's a little bit of everything, but the best way is to contact us, whether stop by in person. Uh, we have a very friendly, open, uh, professional office where you can just come by to say, hey, Victor, I just get an A in my class, you know, anything at all. <laughs> and since my background is also in finance, I can sit down with you to work with you on a non-financial issue, whether it's affect your daily life, or your living expenses, budget, anything at all. So we have one minute remaining. Any last minute burning questions? All right, well, let's give our panels a round of applause. Thank you. Girls, thank you for having us.